<laughs> okay, and then we'll uh, share the screen. Uh, there we go. We were in, this is uh, Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> Mark chapter 12, it starts in verse 11, or chapter, the previous chapter 2. It was a series of questions, similar to what happened earlier in the Gospel of Mark when there were five questions, uh, four by someone else and then one by Jesus. Here, uh, the same pattern happens, three by someone else, and then a final question by Jesus that stumps everyone and shows that Jesus is the, the master uh, of, the, of the debate. This third question uh, comes from the Sadducees, uh, as it says in verse 18, who say there is no resurrection. So they were, they were asking a question, kind of like stump the expert, uh, trying to, to uh, trip, uh, you know, trying to ridicule this belief in the resurrection. So the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us, that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And that comes, uh, that's described in uh, Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. It's called a leveret marriage from the Latin word lever, uh, which means a brother-in-law. Uh, it's interesting they had a specific word for brother-in-law. English kind of cobbles one together. Uh, but the, the point was that the, the, the man, uh, you know, the, the man who died, he has a, he's, he's a head of, you know, he, it was a very, you know, patrilineal society. So that they, they were interested in the, uh, that each man should have a, a heritage, a inheritors. But if he died before he was able to have children, and someone else, was, his brother, was supposed to marry uh, his widow and then have children, uh, one, at least one child, by that widow. And then that child would then be the uh, inheritor of the first man's properties. Uh, so here that the Sadducees were using this uh, social system uh, to point out, or try, what they thought pointing out was the, the folly of uh, a resurrection. In verse 20, they say, now they tell us this made-up story. Now, there were seven brothers. It's like they, they were tearing, making up a parable of their own. They were, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died with no child. It was the same with the third. And implied also the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. I said verse 22, in fact, none of the seven left any children, uh, but they had all married the same woman. Uh, so the last of all, they say the woman died too. So uh, there's the, the, the question they thought that would you know, point out the folly of the resurrection. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And they, they think it's just absolutely out of the question that a woman could have seven wives or seven husbands, uh, even though a man could have seven wives. Uh, you know, there was a, a little double standard there in, in their society, but they're, they're, they, they just thought, well, this is, uh, doesn't make any sense. How could this happen? So Jesus replied in verse 24, are you not in error? Uh, this is kind of like an insult to them. They were probably, and you know, they were, this is the wealthier class. They were probably well educated. Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? So Jesus then says, When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. And this saying has given rise to a lot of speculation as to what Jesus actually meant. Uh, technically, he says that, all, that people are not given in marriage. Uh, that means they won't be making new marriages. So some say, well, they'll, they'll still keep their old ones. But that really wouldn't answer the Sadducees' question. 
um, this, this woman had seven legitimate marriages to seven different men. Uh, would she keep them all? Uh, so I, I, I don't think that, you know, saying that they keep their marriages, uh, that's, that's Jesus' answer really wouldn't uh, uh, answer the Sadducees' objection very well, if that were the case. So what is he saying, that people are not married at all? Uh, now, surely, you know, people who have been married, you know, 50 years, uh, the, you know, they are best friends forever, they hope. Uh, surely in the resurrection, they're going to be still best friends. It's like they're still going to be married. You know, once, you know, the, the woman will still, still be a woman. The man will still be a man, even though they're resurrected. Uh, what will their relationship be? Jesus doesn't really say. Um, so uh, he says in some way that the resurrected people are similar to angels in some respect. And again, that's in what respect are they? Are they in what respect are they like angels? Well, certainly not being given in marriage. Uh, in some ways, and if we compare, you know, Jesus was resurrected. Uh, presumably, we will be resurrected similarly. Uh, Paul's, you know, comments about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 imply that we will receive a similar kind of glory. Uh, but in, in, in what way are they, you know, like angels? Jesus is like angel. He was able to appear and disappear. Uh, or walk through walls, or however that happened, he was able to appear inside of locked, uh, a locked room, and in some way, uh, and but he was also kind of a puzzling appearance too, because like disciples on the road to Emmaus, they did not recognize him, so he was changed in some way. Uh, he was able to change. Uh, they recognized him later when he broke the bread. But Jesus' comment here is really, uh, is, it doesn't give us as much information as we would like. And you know, we can speculate about the kind of relationships we will have. Uh, presumably, they will be better than what we have now. Uh, they, but it, exactly what that entails, uh, it's hard for us to specify. Uh, you know, as far as our the kind of nature of our life, our uh, mental abilities, our relationship abilities, all, seemingly all of that will be increased. Then Jesus asks the Sadducees a kind of a counter question. Uh, in verse 26, it says, now about the dead rising, haven't you read in the book of Moses? Well, of course they have. Uh, they, they, they had read it, but they hadn't thought about the implications in the way that Jesus had here. So haven't you read that? In the account of the burning bush, that's Exodus 3, how God said to him, God, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So haven't you read that? You know, Jesus says he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. <clears throat> so again, he's, he's putting them down and putting down this belief in the resurrection. Now, they were, they were the wealthy class. They had it pretty good in this life. So they were not you know, banking on having another life to make up for whatever injustices, mistreatments they got in this life, whereas the common people generally did believe in a resurrection because they saw that as the only way possible for God to right all the wrongs that happen in this life. Are they saying, well, God is a God of justice. He is going to make it good somehow. It doesn't happen in this life. So we believe there's going to be another. There are, uh, the Old Testament doesn't say a lot about resurrection. Uh, it does, you know, there's a couple of scriptures, only one in Daniel, that's definitely about resurrection. There's one in Job that at least implies there will be a resurrection, and one in Isaiah. But it's, you know, that's not a lot. 
for the length of the book. Uh, resurrection became a more prominent belief in Judaism uh, after the Old Testament was completed and before the New Testament was started. And, and that, that approximately 300 some years before Jesus interest in and uh, doctrines about the resurrection became more uh, developed. But here, here Jesus is saying that God reveals himself to be the God of Abraham. Even after Abraham had died, God is still his God. So Jesus is saying that implies uh, that Abraham is going to live again. Jesus is, uh, now, some will say, all right, Jesus is saying that Abraham is currently alive, but that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying that Abraham, he's talking about a resurrection. Uh, and there's a difference between Abraham being alive in spirit and being, have, being resurrected. Resurrection always talks about a body. Uh, and like, uh, say, in the book of Acts, Peter could say, David is dead and buried. The New Testament kind of leaves us a little bit unclear as to the status of people between death and resurrection. Some call it an intermediate state. Uh, where uh, they say that this people die and go to be with the Lord, their spirit or some aspect of them is with the Lord. Uh, their body has not yet been resurrected. So there's this kind of in-between time for uh, the dead. And the New Testament doesn't give us a lot of information on that. So some will emphasize the, uh, I don't know, that people die and go to heaven, be with the Lord. Others will emphasize there is a resurrection to come. Well, both are true. Uh, which, which is the relative emphasis that can vary according to the person. The important thing, the important part of it is that God's in charge and he will take care of his people uh, in the way that he knows is best uh, and whatever details are, you know, are known best to him. So that's a, a big controversy uh, among, some, among some people, others it's not so much. Uh, but anyway, that, so this question of the, the Sadducees brings up this other detail that really wasn't part of the Sadducee question, but it touches on in this particular passage. Uh, do any of you have any questions about this passage or, or, or the extra stuff, the, the extra uh, controversy that I threw in there? <laughs> Everybody here believes in a resurrection. <laughs> yeah, I think and the New Testament's pretty clear on that. And, and clearly Jesus was siding with those who believed in a resurrection, which included the Pharisees. And when it came to Jesus was, you know, Jesus had a lot of controversies with the Pharisees, but he was much closer to their position than he was to the Sadducees. In fact, there's one book uh, with the title, Jesus the Pharisee, <laughs> that brought out all the ways in which Jesus was similar to the Pharisees. And in, like in some of the arguments, uh, his argument about divorce was, was discussed by different schools of Pharisees. Jesus was kind of close to that stream of uh, Judaism. And whereas the Sadducees, no, he, he had very little to do with those, with, with them. As he said, you, you are badly mistaken. And the, the next passage is uh, the fourth question, the greatest commandment. And here, th this question is asked not so much as a challenge to Jesus, but as a, as it seems to be a desire, sincere desire for an answer. One of the teachers of the law, uh, came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he probably believed in a resurrection too, so he thought, oh yeah, Jesus has a good response to those pesky Sadducees. 
Uh, Jesus had given him a good answer, so he asked Jesus. All right, I respect your opinion. I, of all the commandments, which is the most important? So the most important one, Jesus answered in verse 29, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And most of that is a quote from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And typically, uh, like uh, at, at the time of Jesus, first century, even a century before Jesus, this was part of the, the Jewish prayer every morning that they would recite this verse from Deuteronomy. Or, uh, yeah, Deuteronomy. And they also had a, another one from Leviticus, and uh, I forget which, but all that was included in what they called the Shema. Uh, is the Hebrew word for hear. Uh, <laughs> hear, O Israel. Uh, listen. Uh, so, so this, they, the Jews reminded themselves of this saying every morning. So Jesus is using it here, saying, this is the most important command right here. We say it every day. But he adds something to it. Uh, he, he adds, with your mind. That, that wasn't in the original, but there doesn't, he doesn't, uh, I don't know, there doesn't seem to be any theological reason for that particular addition. It's just a, a figure of speech for with all of your being, with all of you, are, with all of who you are, love the Lord your God. And the second, he says, you know, the, the man only asked for the most important, but Jesus wants to add in this next one as well. Uh, partly because a lot of Jews, you know, but say, they said the first part every day. They thought they had that one down. They did love the Lord your God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. But they were falling short in the second command that Jesus mentioned here. The second is this. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. From a different part of the books of Moses, Leviticus 19, 18. And uh, that there's a, a lot. That that is a a, a very tall order. Uh, Jerry uh, asked last time. You know, does, does that mean? You know, is is this a, a limitation here? If we don't really like ourselves, does that mean that we shouldn't really like other people too? <laughs> well, no. It, it's it's not referring to exact like this, but it is a, a, a expression that we are to love. Of, are you muted. We are to. Uh, have respect for other people, just as we would want them to respect us. It's the golden rule that Jesus uh, gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Do to others what you want them to do to you. That's simply a paraphrase of this love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and Jesus says, there is no commandment greater than these. So these are kind of the these twin foundation stones on which everything else could be built. So the man replied, verse 32, well said, teacher, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. So we heard Mark repeating what the man repeats of Jesus. Mark is giving it some emphasis by having uh, the man repeat it. You are right in saying that God is one. There is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, then the man adds something else. It is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the man is even going further than what Jesus had said, and rightly so. Uh, the, the prophets had something similar. Uh, Amos and Micah had both commented that uh, you know, mercy, showing mercy is more important than sacrifice. Doing justice is more important than keeping uh, religious holidays. Uh, so the man is kind of continuing in the same, uh, same, same line of thought as the uh, earlier prophets had said. Uh, and Mark is quoting it with approval, I think. 
because uh, Jesus answers in verse 34, Jesus saw that he had answered wisely. You are not far from the kingdom of God. So this man had seemed to have uh, you know, agreement with what Jesus had said about the priority uh, or the that love for God needs to be shown by love for neighbor. The two go together. Uh, if, if we love one, we need to love the other. And Mark concludes there from then, from then on, or, yeah, from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Nobody was challenging Jesus because they saw that Jesus got the better of anyone's uh, argument. Uh, any, oh, does that mean, Mike, that yeah. if I love my two neighbors, uh, the rest of the world can go about their own business? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's right. In, in Luke, uh, they follow up that, uh, that uh, interaction there with a, with a man saying, well, then who is my neighbor? <laughs> so, so Jesus responds by with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, saying, and, and to summarize the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, it's a, he describes the person who helped the person who had need. And he said, go, you know, go and do likewise. Uh, that's how you, it's not, it's, it's how you be a good neighbor. It's the question is not who is my neighbor. The question you should ask is, how can I be a neighbor to other people? Uh, so it's kind of turning things around. But whoever you see uh, can be your neighbor. <laughs> it's, it not, okay, neighbor. It's not just the, 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 the person or the family in the house right next to you. It's also the, the person down the block. Uh, it's the homeless person who walks down the street. Uh, you know, all, all of those are our neighbors, the ones we live with. You would have thought he would have said that love all humans or something to that effect. Yeah, it's, but I, I guess he was wanting to, uh, you know, use, he was quoting from scripture. So he used a scripture that, uh, that pointed toward that. Uh, the Old Testament, I guess, none of them ever say, you know, that you should love everyone. But Jesus expanded that. He even said, love your enemies. Uh, so, so there's much more to it than just loving those who people, those people who like us. Uh, I love those who love me. You know, we're, we're good friends together, but we hate everybody else. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you've, yeah, it would be nice if he had kind of expanded that, but in, in a way he did. And in other places, uh, when he said, love your enemies, uh, do good to all, as what Paul said. So yeah, that, those commands are in there. But in this case, the a teacher of the law had kind of asked him to, well, can you, can you cite me some scriptures? And what's the most important? So Jesus is replying with scripture. Anyone else? Hey, Mike. Yes. Mike? Oh, yes, Tom. No, go, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting somebody. Go ahead, whoever's first. No, no, you're, you're, you're there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Would, would it be fair to say, Mike, that uh, this gentleman that was asking the question, it was more, it was one of those friendly dialogues where he was almost a little bit teachable. Uh, he, it seemed the, the the feel of this seems to be a little different than some of the other confrontational questions. Would that be true? Yeah, yeah, yes, that, that is true. Yeah. Okay. And, and right, because the the man replied with well said, the man was teachable. He was he seemed to be asking a genuine question. He was willing to learn the answer. Uh, okay, good. Okay. All right, he, thank he you. Was, I'll, 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 okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go ahead and mute myself. I just wanted to, because the, the, the feel of it just felt uh, so much more friendly than some of the other yeah. questions that we see in, in scripture and so and when he said he wasn't far from the kingdom of god then his his attitude was uh you know uh, somewhat more open than some of the other sadducees or i mean this was a pharisee of course but he was he was a little bit more open than to jesus would that be fair yeah i, I think so it does it doesn't say that he was a yeah he was a teacher of the law not necessarily a pharisee 
but he, yeah, he was trained in some way. Uh, could have been in uh, many scribes or uh, teachers that were Pharisees, uh, but apparently that wasn't an important part of the story in this case. Uh, okay. He was asked okay. a question that other Jews of the time did ask as well. They kind of had discussions that we see some results of that in the Talmud. They had discussions about, well, which law is the most important? You know, what's the what's the center point of all of it? I, I found it interesting that he sort of added a little bit to the discussion after he asked the question too. So it just it just seemed to have a a, a more pleasant feel. So hey, th thank you very much. I'll I'll mute myself again. And sorry if I interrupted somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he he did add something, and that's. If this is one place in the Gospels where a scribe is a favorite. Uh, it's, this scribe comes off better than any other scribe. I, did you pick up on uh, when Jesus answered this man, it sounded kind of like he knew this man was going to pass away pretty soon. If you read what it said. He hmm. says, you're near the kingdom of God. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> <laughs> that made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was as intense. <laughs> it's, maybe it's kind of a uh, short. Uh, if we expand it, it might be the meaning might be you are your understanding is close to what you mm. in the kingdom. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you're, you have a creative uh, twist on it. <laughs> <laughs> It comes to the good Lord, I take everything serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When Tom was talking, uh, I thought about Jesus bringing a child to him and saying, of such is the kingdom of God. And when Tom mentioned about the teachability of the scribe, uh, so yes. that could uh, be applied as well or considered. And what that reminds me of also is that everyone, we're individuals. No two are the same. Our individual in any group or any, we're all individuals. And that's how God sees us and that's how he treats us and that's how he deals with us as individuals. And we're all different. Right, yeah, Jesus did not judge him by the group he was part of. Right. Yeah, I seem to remember in Acts also that uh, among the converts there were uh, high priests and uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees that were converted to Christianity. Yes, that's yeah, right. Some were in Acts, yeah. Apparently quite a few of the Pharisees were. Uh, yeah, and some priests. Uh, yeah. Right. It, not, not, not all of them had closed minds. They're all individuals. All right. Let's look at the next passage then. Here it is in this one, Jesus asked the question of his own. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? To say who Jesus is asking this of, uh, but, you know, and, then, and then, so Jesus describes the uh, situation. David himself in this psalm, speaking by the Holy Spirit, this is part of inspired scripture, David declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls this person Lord, and can he be his son? So normally, a father would not call his son a lord. Uh, so there's, there's something going, else going on in this verse. And as, as far as we know, the Jews did not view this verse as a messianic scripture. They did not attribute it to the Messiah. Uh, that developed later with Christians. Uh, so Jesus is bringing up a new... Uh, a new riddle for them, I guess. You know, if if the uh, 
He says, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, the first Lord is presumably God, but who is this second Lord? And Jesus doesn't answer that question. But the readers of Mark know the answer to the question. So I, I think Mark is including this as kind of a, a little uh, a sly, uh, you know, like it, what some call an Easter egg for, for the readers of Mark. Just, oh, they'll say, oh, yes, I know, I know, I know. Uh, because they, they know uh, by this time in history that they know, they see this scripture as a messianic scripture. This verse, in, in fact, is the verse that is the ultimate verse that's quoted the most often in the New Testament. Especially the part about sit at my right hand. That part gets quoted that's, um, like 10 different times, 10, 10 different places. Where Jesus is at the right hand of God. Uh, so Mark's readers would know that Jesus was the Lord that David was referring to. And how can he be David's? Well, he is the son of David, but he's also David's Lord because he is greater than David, even though his son. So readers know the answer to the riddle. But in, in uh, the setting of where Jesus is, he just leaves it as a riddle, and he does not explain the riddle. But people were unable to answer his question. They say they might say, well, well that's a good question. <laughs> they didn't have an answer for it. And, and Mark concludes there, the large crowd listened to him with delight. They thought, you know, this is a great one. And but seems like nobody asked him for the uh, the resolution of the riddle. Now that could have gotten him into trouble with the authorities right there. But that will happen soon enough. I have a question, Mike. Yes, Jerry. How can he have enemies under his feet and be in heaven? <laughs> uh, you see, heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool. So every all of the earth is under his feet. <laughs> So we're all enemies. It's his footstool. It's a it's a figure of speech for yeah. his authority. Uh, and actually, and uh, ancient uh, conquerors would sometimes do that too. Uh, literally, you know, whenever they conquered uh, people, they would have the people lie down, and the conqueror would put his foot on their throat, just indicating he had the power of life and death over them. Uh, and so they were, uh, and as they uh, were subservient to him, they, mm -hmm. uh, they, they laid down and said, oh, that's better than getting killed with a sword. Uh, so that it, it was, so it's under his feet, uh, but also it then became a figure of speech, even for when it wasn't literally applied uh, to actual feet, but under his authority. Anyone else? All right. And Jesus goes with a few more, a couple more things of his own here. A warning against the teachers of the law. Verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. Uh, he just had an interaction with one of them, which turned out to be good. But here he says, watch out. Uh, they like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Uh, they like to be seen as important and have the most important seats in the synagogues, the places of honor at banquets. Uh, they like attention. Verse 40, they devour widows' houses and a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Now, it's not wrong to have lengthy prayers, but it's wrong to do them for show. And it is certainly wrong to devour widows' houses. And that seems to be some kind of a figure of speech, too, for uh, where they're cheating them out of their inheritance. Uh, in some way, it's not like they're actually eating, eating the stones and uh, lumber that made up the house. Are somehow taking away their inheritance money, uh, where they're kicking them out 
of their houses, forcing them to live somewhere else, or in, in some way defrauding them. So Jesus is saying those teachers of the law, and, and some have speculated that the widows would, uh, you know, since it was difficult for uh, a widow to uh, make financial transactions and interact with society, they would sometimes uh, ask a, a, uh, a religious person, a teacher of the law, to take care of their properties for them, uh, to be executor of the estate, I guess. And so those executors would then uh, you know, benefit themselves more than the widows, the people they were supposed to take care of. They would make a show of lengthy prayers, trying to get a reputation for uh, being a religious person and worthy of people's trust. Uh, but really, they were doing it for to, self, to serve themselves rather than uh, any really uh, for love of God. So Jesus so, would say they'll, they'll be punished in some way. So you can assume this would apply even today if you were a preacher and took advantage of old people. Yeah. Uh, that you'd be in, like he says, punished most severely. Yeah, there were the people who ought to know better. You know, they, they, yeah. you know they, they have studied the law. They ought to know. And and like James says, that preachers will be judged more severely. You know, that, that's like they are uh, people who study the word, uh, ought to uh, have, a, have a higher uh, ethic uh, responsibility for doing what it says. Wonder what severity that is. Yeah. I'm going to be worse than, I, I, be worse I, than hell, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to find out. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> uh, any comments from others? All right, yeah, that was kind of a short passage there. But the next one is related in that it's also talking about a widow. Verse 41, Jesus sat down at the place where offerings were put. This is probably in the temple courts. They had... Uh, some say 13 different boxes scattered around the temple courts where people could make donations to various funds uh, in the temple uh, for different uh, activities. Uh, so, uh, so see, Jesus was sat down and watched. Uh, they put the crowd money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. Uh, they, the Containers were made out of metal, so if you threw in coins, it would make a noise. Uh, whether I don't, whether that was a, you know intentional or not, some people like to hear the sound of lots of coins going in. Uh, but here it is, verse forty-two: the poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Now each of those copper coins were worth one sixty-fourth of a person's day's wage. Uh, so, so if you put that in today's money, if somebody might make, uh, if they're making $10 an hour, they work eight hours, they might get $80 in a day. Uh, one sixty-fourth of that is a bit over a dollar. So here it is, these copper coins uh, were worth a, a couple dollars. Uh, that's kind of in, in today's money. It's not no longer the penny the copper coin, we don't even have copper coins anymore. Uh, copper is too expensive for that. They use aluminum now. <laughs> uh, so here, here this, this widow put in a couple dollars. Uh, so verse 43, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They all gave, uh, gave out of their wealth but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So not literally, it's not true that she put in more than the others. But Jesus is saying in terms of her ability to give, she made a much bigger sacrifice than the others did. And some, will, some say, well, this is an illustration of how the uh, teachers of the law 
are defrauding widows. They're putting guilt trips on widows to give their last penny uh, to the temple. Uh, maybe, and, and, and that certainly has modern uh, parallels as well with, with the way some preachers do it. But I don't think that's Jesus' intention here in this passage about the widow. Jesus isn't really using the occasion to criticize the temple or the temple leaders. He's, he's simply using it to praise the woman as, as a good example. Uh, she was she was willing. She she was generous. She uh, loved God with all of her heart, and that was how she knew to express it. There, that's kind of a, an offertory message that we have sometimes. <laughs> Any comments from you? Uh, Mike. Yes, uh, Mike. Uh, you know, it, it just, you know, what, what always strikes me, because my mom was uh, uh, a widow, and I've, I've known many, many widows over the years, and uh, they've always, uh, I've always just been so impressed with their, um, their attitude, and uh, I mean, you know, throughout the, you know, the gospel, it seems Jesus just has a, a very tender heart for widows, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the kindness of, uh, of 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 him toward widows and uh, would we say by this time his own mom was a widow would that be correct yeah probably so yeah we don't hear joseph mentioned uh and since uh he's mentioned when luke was 12 but he's not mentioned any time after that so yeah, they, yeah. yeah most scholars uh, agree that he was uh, she, he probably died Probably oh, because he was older, he was much older than Mary. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I still remember, if I can take just a moment here, how Mr. DeCock Sr. talked to all the ministry about make sure you you take care of widows because he said he was he was in, in the Navy and he had gotten off a ship and he had uh, played uh, played a game of uh, cards with somebody and he it wasn't quite the way he wanted it to go, so he was trying to escape. and. These guys uh, followed him and were beating him up. And he said, uh, a bunch of widows came by with their umbrellas and beat them all to a pulp. And he said, so don't ever put your, <laughs> don't, don't, ever, don't ever turn your back on widows. You know? So, I mean, it, and again, that love for widows is just very precious throughout uh, you know, the gospels. Anyway, I, I, I took too much time there, but I'll, I'll be quiet now. But I just wanted to share that. It just strikes me every time I see uh, examples by Jesus talking about widows. He has such a tender heart toward them. Right. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard that story. That, that's uh, Joe DeCotch's dad that you're, you're referring to, who, the one who was in the Navy. Uh, but, yeah, he, he, he was in charge of uh, as, dispersing assistance to widows for many years as well in the Pasadena area. The next chapter, chapter 13, is a very controversial one because uh, Jesus uh, starts talking about prophecy and the chapter has been misused uh, in many times. Uh, the point of the chapter that Jesus was trying to make is that uh, you don't know the day or the hour and yet many people have tried to use this chapter to say, oh yes, now we know what the day and the hour is. Uh, so they're, they're using the chapter in a, in a way that's quite foreign to what uh, Jesus intended. So anyway, we can uh, see how it starts here. We won't have time to go through it all, but we'll finish it up next week. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And I, I think they're, I mean, the stones are indeed massive. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the of, that's part of the kind of the foundation, the outer wall of the Temple Mount. And they've got some huge stones 
um, there. It's like all of, from this length right there, it's like 40 foot long stone. These are just incredibly massive stones weighing tons. Uh, it was a kind of an engineering feat for uh, the people to put them together. Here at a different corner, someone's outlined the, the size of the stones that are there. And when they, when they weigh 100 tons, they are not going to move very well. King Herod, uh, Herod the Great, uh, the one who was alive before when Jesus was born, he built, he enlarged the temple complex. There was only a small uh, temple mount, a platform. Herod made it much bigger than, uh, than it was before. He put in these huge stones, and then he filled in dirt between the new stones, the new platform walls, and the old one. And so that, that that fill then would be then be used to roll in another layer of stones. Then they would fill it in, roll in another layer of stones. So it's kind of working their way up, building a wall and filling it in, filling it in behind at the same time. And they put the biggest stones in the corner here uh, because that would make it architecturally stronger. Uh, the biggest stone that they have found is this one. Uh, it is 11 feet high and like 20 feet long. They estimate that this wing weighs 600 tons. And it's just amazing that they could actually move these things to where they, where they are now. Uh, fortunately, the quarry was uphill. So they, could, they, they were going downhill to get to the temple. So that's a little bit easier, but still managing a stone that is 500 tons with uh, oxen pulling it uh, on, on rollers, on, uh, on, on logs, that would be how they would roll it, and pulling it with ropes. That's a lot of ropes in order to be able to pull 500 tons. So this, this man is standing actually inside the wall. Uh, they have tunneled. Uh, they, you know, I, I was talking about how they built the wall, filling it in with uh, a dirt fill. They tunneled some of that out of there uh, to, in order to see what was behind the wall. And actually, a lot of it had already been done before. And these rectangular holes that you see in the stone were chiseled in there later to serve as uh, adhesion points for a plaster lining. They had used this the whole area as a cistern to hold water, and the plaster was to make it waterproof. Uh, but all of that just doesn't, uh, I mean, it's just a massive uh, feat for them to move these stones in place. And these biggest, heaviest stones were on the bottom to provide stability to all the structure on top. It's quite a, quite a tall wall. Uh, this is actually a, a very long stone. Uh, it kind of doesn't look like it, uh, but there, all of that is one stone that's kind of cracked in. It's got a crack in the middle, so it looks like uh, three different stones. But it's actually one stone originally, and it maybe cracked later. But they made it one long stone because this is the uh, support, the anchor point for an archway that uh, went away from this wall over a street and over to a stairway that went up. So it, it needed to be extra strong because all the, uh, the archway was resting on it. Uh, so that, uh, that's what, 45 feet long. Uh, uh, just a, another massive stone that they have there. These are some of the smaller stones that were on top. These were the stones that the Romans were able to push over, uh, but they are still massive stones. Uh, and so the disciples' amazement at the grandeur of the temple, I think, is quite understandable. That what massive stones are in these buildings? And this is just one of the, uh, you know, the, the Temple of Diana at Ephesus was one of the great wonders of the, uh, wonders of the ancient world. The temple complex in Jerusalem was twice that size. Uh, it was a really grand building. Uh, 
And one of the rabbis said, if you've never seen a temple, you've never seen a beautiful building. <laughs> it's like, it's, this, this one is the, uh, they, you know, the tops of all. Uh, so yeah, the, the, it's, the disciples were right to say and you know, talk about, well, this is a pretty amazing building. But uh, Jesus kind of threw some uh, cold water on that as well. <laughs> How did these compare to the pyramids, the stones and those? I don't know. Uh, I know, yeah, both of them were dealing with very large uh, stones. Stones. And, and they were uh, <clears throat> very well shaped. The, the lines were straight. The stones fit together really well. Uh, so yeah, there, there was a very good engineering feats going on. And the Egyptians mm -hmm. were built, you know, a thousand years earlier. So you know, the engineering uh, uh, know, expertise is even more amazing uh, there. And there they were they were going uphill to the top of the pyramids. So yeah, they they had a number of uh, engineering challenges and. Uh, as far as I know, I, they still don't know quite how they did it. They can see how they can handle some stones and do some of the things, how they completed it all, especially mm. with, like the pyramids have uh, shafts uh, that would, like, would point to the North Star on a certain day of the year. Uh, that took a lot of uh, calculus before calculus was invented <laughs> to in order to be able to, uh, to to make those kind of alignments. So yeah, all of those were you know, marvelous engineering achievements. Yes. Do, so these stones they're getting, they're taking, I assume, taking them out the side of a mountain? Yeah, it, it's, it, the quarry was not, it was just further uphill from Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was not the highest point uh, on that mountain. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was there, and, and that's exactly where the quarry was now. They, they, you know, the, the archaeologists, archaeologists have dug it up and see. Uh, actually, stones were cut out, uh, and but still they were still in place. It's like they hadn't finished the job; they had started, and something interrupted. Uh, but uh, and so, but they got a, got to see a little bit of look as to how they actually quarried the stones out. You know, they would cut all around the stone in a big rectangle. It was still attached to the bottom, you know, the bottom. And in order to dislodge it uh, from the bottom, they would stack wood into the cracks all along the side. They would fill it with wood and then pour in water so that wood would swell. And that force of the swelling wood was strong enough to move those 500 ton stones. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it's quite quite interesting. Uh, yeah, just to see how some of those things were were built. Now, the, the Temple Mount itself is built in several different layers. Some of it was uh, done by uh, uh, you know, the the second temple, the the one that uh, was built by Ezra and Nehemiah. In, the, in those days, a small part of that foundation stone, that foundation area is still visible. Most of the uh, rest of the foundation, we see Herod's foundation, but then the, the various destructions tore down part of that, and then it was rebuilt. So there's also a, you know, a layer uh, done by the Crusaders, and just different. It's, it's just an archaeological museum uh, right in front of, in front of you and, and on the wall as to what, what goes on there. There's uh, another story like that with a gentleman that lives in the Everglades. He's a hermit, but he by himself moved stones about this size uh, and built a home down here. They don't know how he did it. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Yeah. Barb, you've been there and seen that. Do uh, you have any comments on it? <laughs> uh, what What interests me uh, is the, the style of writing of Mark. He loves to uh, contrasts 
and then compare. So when we started with the, you know, the Sadducees, they asked the question of the resurrection. And then he said, uh, are you ignorant? And then when this teacher of the law asked the greatest commandment, and he said, oh, he kind of praised him. You are not far from the kingdom. So, so first, you know, but there's a, a guy who's knowledgeable. But then later he said, uh, warning, he gave a warning, you know, these people, you know, teachers of the law, they devour widows. And then he praised the widow, widow smack, because I know the stories are not uh, consequential, but uh, sequential, I mean, but the way he arranges it. So he's, uh, do you think he's trying to um, tell his readers that what Jesus' words are, they are better or elevated much more what people think? Because, you know, when he compares and contrasts or what uh, or what uh, righteous people or people who are humble like the widows, he tries to compare their values versus, you know, that. And then in the story, you know, he says, this, they're marvelous tongues. And then the reply will be on verse 2. And Jesus replied with his tongues and say, ah, those tongues are <laughs> not nothing. So there's a really, you know, uh, compare and contrast. So, so. Do you, did you agree with that, that he's trying to, uh, the, Mark is trying to say that Jesus' words or the, the values or, you know, the people who, who make those characteristics are better than these scribes and scientists, the, what they teach? Um, what do you think the point of Mark was? Yeah, I, I think the contrast is there. And that's uh, to, uh, to, help, to help make a point. It would be not like that. All right, Barbara. I just wanted to mention, Mike, I, I'm, I'm impressed with your, your um, descriptions and the, the photos. Uh, it has been a real privilege to have been there and to stand inside that temple and to actually touch those ancient stones. And uh, even there's an area there where they believe the, the Holy of Holies was kept. So I'm looking forward to your being able to go, and uh, you you sound like one of the tour guides already. So, <laughs> so I thank you for your research. <laughs> I, I stumbled across a really good website today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can I can um, imagine what the disciples must have thought when Jesus said that those stones would be overthrown and and I mean they it was beyond their their imagination because the temple was such a beautiful edifice it was it was uh, it was everything to the Jew so yeah you can just think you know when it, when it yeah most of these stones were too big for one person to even budge in the slightest. Uh, so the disciples could rightly wonder, you know, how could this ever happen that one stone would not be left upon the other? One of the most shocking statements he made, I guess. <laughs> All right, Let's, anybody else? Oh, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> well, we'll have to we'll have to get back to this next week and go, go see see what he said about it i've, I've already uh given you the clue <laughs> jesus said one stone will not be left upon it <laughs> and we saw some evidence of that already <laughs> all right uh any any famous last words <laughs> yeah hi everyone oh. hi everybody. <laughs> This is Cecilia. I'm sorry I'm Goodbye. late. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>